Welcome to Downton Blabby, a podcast for Downton Abbey fans. Now, presenting your host, Sandy Max. Hello, I'm Sandy, and this is season two of Downton Blabby. I'm excited to return to the podcast as we fans get excited for the film sequel. In this episode, I'll break down the trailer for the new movie that comes out March 18th, 2022, Downton Abbey. A new era. Now, if you're new to the Downton Blabby podcast, I invite you to listen to the season one episodes for fun conversations about Downton Abbey and enjoy looking back at the anticipation we had, the expectations, and even amusing reviews of the first film. In this episode, after the movie trailer breakdown, I'll include my very first interview so you can get to know me better and why I even wanted to start Downton Blabby. Now, this is a very inclusive podcast. You are welcome to participate in any way you can or want to, whether it's leaving podcast reviews, emailing me, sending me an audio reply with a voice note, or responding through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Plus, sign up for my email list at sandymax.com. I'll list out all my contact info at the end of this episode. For now, let's dive into the movie trailer. Then we can break down some highlights about it. Thanks to Focus Features for providing this movie trailer for Downton Abbey, A New Era. Years ago... Before you were born, I met a man, and now I've come into the possession of a villa in the south of France. What? Three, two, one. They better be warned. The British are coming. And with that, I will say good night and leave you to discuss my mysterious past. Let's break it down and see what we can learn about the new movie. As much as I like the piano music, I realize that it takes almost too long to get to the emotional, real theme music. It's so Pavlovian, you know, when you hear the Downton Abbey theme song. But the piano chords draw me in. So what do we see first? Like cream-colored art deco vertical blinds slowly sliding. It reminds me a bit of the graphic design of the Great Gatsby movie in 2013, which I liked a lot. We see a beautiful wide shot of High Clare Castle, Downton Abbey itself, coming home again, baby. And a different outdoor angle of two of those impressive, wonderful, mature cypress trees on the High Clare Castle grounds. A shot of two men in suits and three women wearing ankle-length skirts. They're strolling the lawn toward the castle. Two white parasols as functional accessories for the females. We get a brief frontal view of these modern folk on the lawn, and we see that Lady Rosamond, who was absent from the first film, she is one of the parasol holders. Lady Cora carrying the other parasol with Edith, <clears throat> sorry, the Marchioness of Hexham next to Cora. There's a dude in a suit next to Edith, but I don't recognize him, and it isn't Bertie. Yes, a flash of a smiling Dowager Countess. Another shot of smiling sisters Edith and Mary in the library room of Downton Abbey. Note they're not smiling at each other, but they are at least in pleasant cohabitation on screen in this moment, uh, as they were in the last scene of the first movie together in the ballroom where Mary compliments Edith by calling her a devious cat. One of my favorite moments from the first film. Donk is smiling now. There he is, Lord Grantham, with one hand hugging close a girl that I assume is his granddaughter, Sibby, who looks like she's nearly 10 years old. In his other hand, a cup of tea, because, you know, England. The Dowager Countess seems to be holding court in the library with a small group that seems to include Rosamond, Mary, someone who I almost thought was Julian Fellows, which would be kind of like a vintage Hitchcock cameo if it was. I think it looks like it might be Murray, if you remember Lord Grantham's London lawyer from the TV series. And I think it's a profile of Robert in The Gathering 2. Violet 
drops this knowledge. Years ago, before you were born, I met a man, and now I've come into the possession of a villa in the south of France. To which Mary says the line she says in every Downton Abbey movie trailer so far. What? I'll tell you what we see while Violet is sharing this news, but I pause here to say, as I have previously on Downton Blabby, I must see a Dowager Countess prequel. A teenage or 20-something Violet ripping off zingers while carousing in her pre-Grantham and Prince Carragan years. And whatever adventurous, impressive activity she participated in to earn a French villa decades later... Oh, yes, I want to see that miniseries. Imagine the kind of 1860s Victorian costumes alone. Add in the flirtations and dalliances. I'd see that. But back to looking at a new era. The quick images we see while the Dowager Countess is giving her real estate update are a tiny painted portrait of a young Violet. Carson the butler, yay, looking intently at the tiny portrait, retrieving it from a cabinet as if maybe he'd seen it dozens of times before but never really noticed it. We get our first glimpse of Tom and Tuppence. Okay, Tom Branson and his new wife Lucy, played by Tuppence Middleton, and Edith and Bertie as Carson seems to be holding the portrait. The two couples are dressed in beige-colored outfits, which kind of reminds me of the cricket match in season three of Downton Abbey. I saw a crack once on social media ages ago, <laughs> the wardrobe worn in that cricket scene, calling it 50 Shades of Beige, with a lot less bondage and spanking. The two couples seem to be approaching Carson, so they too can check out what a young Violet looked like in this tiny portrait. Cut to Robert, a bit aghast that his mom is about to get into some TMI territory. And Mary's... What? Three, two, one. Ah, great drone shot of what must be Violet's villa. A white building with floor-to-ceiling windows, a pair of palm trees to greet you, surrounded by lush greenery and a view of the mountains. Now, during the three, two, one countdown, we get flashes of the little Bates family laughing. Oh my gosh, you'd think Mr. Bates' face would crack. He's not smoldering. So you see the little Bates family in a crowd, Anna, Big John, and Little John, who's wearing a sailor's outfit. Side note, Anna is wearing beige, too. You get a millisecond of a flash, and I mean that. I had to hit pause on the trailer about seven times to get a freeze frame on the quick look at a scene at Tom and Lucy's wedding. Tom, Robert, and Bertie in top hats and tuxes. Robert and Cora, uh, also in beige, with Sibby. Edith and Bertie next to them with our first look at Marigold. Marigold and Sibby are wearing headbands with white flowers, so maybe they're part of the wedding party. More smiles, so it appears that this will be a feel-good movie. But there's got to be some drama somewhere, though, and hopefully better than the Edith, my dress is too big to wear to the ball level of drama. So the three, two, one countdown is a 1920s photographer with one of those big flash bulbs. So those magical moments will be preserved on tintype forever. Now, the next flash is a lineup of wedding guests posing on the grass in front of a stately brick house from left to right. We see kind of socially distanced. But then again, we've seen the show historian Alistair Bruce remind us many times that closeness and affection weren't the style in the early 1900s. So we have Lord Merton sporting a top hat and tails like the other gentlemen attending the wedding, Lady Merton, Rosamond wearing beige, which is a disappointment because I loved her wardrobe in the TV series since she was, to me, like the cool single woman living in London. Her big city clothes were my favorite. Next, Lady Mary holding a little girl, must be Caroline, with her boy George standing in front of her. Not Boy George, but you know what I mean. He seems to be about 10 years old, too, like Sibby. But I'm not sure if that's accurate calendar time or if it's soap opera time. You know, where the kids tend to age at some sort of different rate compared to the adults. Noticeably absent from Mary's side is her husband, Henry Talbot, who barely made an appearance other than bounding up the stairs in the first film. So I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Who is standing by Lady Mary is Maud. Dowager Baroness Bagshaw, Lucy's mom, played by the incredible Imelda Staunton, who's married to Jim Carter in real life, who plays Carson the butler. In the middle are Tom Branson and the second Mrs. Branson, Lucy Smith, Robert and Cora with Sibby in front of them, Edith and Bertie with Marigold in front of them. All the little girls are wearing the headbands with the white flowers on each side, and from the front they kind of look like little Princess Leia's. If you like hats, 
Everyone is wearing one, except for young George, boy George. Uh, But he does have a little Lord Fauntleroy outfit, which may be a lighter shade of beige, but for now, I think it might be a light gray. I prefer to think of it that way. There are a lot of fast edits in this trailer, so during that luxurious eight seconds of the majestic theme of Downton Abbey, we see the words focus features cordially invites you over the Art Deco vertical Venetian blinds design. Then what seems to be the arrival of a platinum blonde movie star via a cool classic convertible car arriving at Downton Abbey. Because once you've hosted the king and queen, how do you top that? With glam, baby, the top's down on the convertible. But of course, this red-lipped lady is gorgeous. Instead of looking like the wreck of the Hesperus upon arrival, like I would, completely windblown. But who is geeked about this lady's arrival? We see Ms. Baxter, Daisy, and Anna looking on from their spots on Downton's driveway. Anna looks a bit unimpressed, while the other two seem starstruck. And yay! There's Thomas by the doorway as part of the formal greeting. Blink and you miss him, though, in this clip, as the focus really is on the glamorous gal in a gown that is not beige as she enters Downton Abbey. The rest of the words on our invitation on the screen appear now in Art Deco font, reading, To the grandest escape of the year. Then we get to see more of the Branson wedding, the couple kissing while flower petals are thrown in handfuls at them. At the reception, Edith spins on the dance floor with Bertie, noticeably unpregnant, I'd add, since that seemed to be an important plot point in the first film and what kept Bertie from being a king's man. Back to the trailer. We see a boat on blue water, green trees on the shore, a mountain in the background. I'm guessing it's a ferry to the French villa. Ahoy, Captain Robert. Yep, he's sitting on the back of the boat, drink in hand. Okay, so probably not actually being the captain of the boat, but he does have the great white hat on. He's holding hands with Cora, who's wearing a beige trench coat, but also some cool sunglasses, to be fair. She's also got a cocktail in hand, and the Granthams are smiling in the sunshine, and a man with a bow tie in a light-colored suit, he seems to be pointing out landmarks on their little voyage. Another drone shot of the French villa, then an outdoor party scene on the patio of a glamorous building. It's got big arched windows, so maybe it's the backyard of the villa. It reminds me a bit of the ballroom scene in the first film. We get a close-up of a singer performing at the party with a jazz orchestra. It is not Jack Ross, but a different person of color, a beautiful lady wearing a shiny dress, a feathered headband, long satin gloves. She's singing in front of one of those fantastic retro microphones. Now, I've seen some online speculation that this character may be Josephine Baker. I can't confirm that, but if you think about it, Josephine Baker did start performing in France in the 1920s, so... It's entirely possible that Julian Fellows would work her into the storyline to emphasize the glamour and excitement of that time. They better be warned. The British are coming. I could listen to Carson read the terms and conditions of an iPhone update. Jim Carter's voice is glorious. And in this part of the trailer, when Carson the butler says, they'd better be warned, we get a look at a grand staircase inside the villa as Robert and Cora arrive. I notice the color scheme seems to be more coral colored. So maybe the beige theme is to signify the English way of being kind of at home and the colors are to signify the more exotic life of being in France. In any case, it's certainly eye candy and appealing so far. I'm just noticing a lot of beige. Now, the biggest mystery to me in the trailer so far There's a woman descending this grand staircase. It is someone who resembles Maud a bit, but it is probably whoever is the keeper of the villa at this time. The dress she's wearing is chic. It's long-sleeved. It's this longer sheath-type skirt with a great ruffle detail on the left side. Unfortunately, it is beige, but this character will undoubtedly have some new story to add to the mix, right? As Robert and Cora enter the villa, I see Edith is with them. Now, Edith is also wearing one of the most curious fashions I have ever seen. Do you remember on the show, I don't remember which season, but Edith has on a plain, long-waisted dress, and around her neck is a thin scarf. The scarf didn't wrap around her neck, but instead it hung straight down into the front of the dress, so just inside the collar, and then pulled out a hole in the front of the dress, kind of like a necktie. I just thought it was an odd look at that time. Well, Edith's dress in this clip has that same scarf hole 
So we go from a scarf hole distraction to a much desired aerial view of Downton Abbey and the estate. And then we see Carson and Elsie. Yay! Our first time seeing Mrs. Hughes. They are walking together outside that familiar quaint church of Downton Abbey when Carson says, the British are coming. Yes, I know that's a terrible impersonation. And with that, I will say good night and leave you to discuss my mysterious past. We see the title of the movie appear over the Art Deco vertical Venetian blinds design and then one more gathering of the cast as Violet bids her farewell. The group is inside the drawing room of Downton Abbey. You know, those pretty mint green walls and ornate gold details and the lampshades dripping with beaded fringe. Oh, no, no! I see Denker in the background getting ready to open the door for the Dowager Countess's exit. Ah! Listen to season one of Downton Blabby. Find out why Denker is my least favorite character. Boo. I want Spratt back if we have Denker. I adore the actor Jeremy Swift. I suppose he's quite busy now with his work on Ted Lasso, but still. Plus, Spratt in the show was going to become the advice columnist at Edith Sold Magazine. So that could still make for an interesting storyline. All right. As Violet is standing to leave, she has a captive audience of the Mertons, the Hexams, the Granthams, and Lady Mary. Another brief glimpse of Thomas standing by, looking handsome as ever in his livery. I'm delighted to report that the women's gowns are in pretty colors of blues, greens, and lavender. A Downton dog is at the feet of Rosamond. The gals in the group look delighted to get to gossiping as the Dowager Countess leaves. I'll tell you which upstairs and downstairs characters' names appear on screen after we talk about the music treatment for a second. How much does the music of Downton Abbey mean to you? I love it. John Lund, the composer, has created the perfect emotional addition to this series. And hearing it in different variations, presentations, and orchestrations is a delight. What a fun touch to hear the accordion approach to invoke a French feel. I really look forward to hearing it in the cinema, on the big theater speakers. Of course, Carson's voice will sound even better in that environment as well. Here are the names we see on screen in that Art Deco font. The first slide lists these upstairs characters. Lord Grantham, Lady Grantham, Lady Mary Talbot, the Dowager Countess of Grantham, Tom Branson, Lucy Branson, Lady Hexham, Lord Hexham, Lady Merton, and Lord Merton. The next slide lists these downstairs characters. Thomas Barrow, Mr. Carson, Mrs. Patmore, Mrs. Hughes, Mr. Bates, Anna Bates, Daisy Parker, Andy Parker, which means they've gotten married, Mr. Mosley, and Miss Baxter. Okay, so although we didn't see Mrs. Patmore, Andy, or the undebatable star of the first film, Mr. Mosley, we don't see any of them in the trailer for the sequel so far. They are part of the cast. Don't expect to see the dashing Matthew Good as Henry Talbot in this film. He's not on any cast list that I can find, and he has been busy acting in several other projects. So I'm curious how he'll be accounted for in this storyline, maybe off selling used cars. I have to think focus groups would have wanted at least one look at Mr. Mosley in the trailer. He is a huge selling point for me, but at least I see he'll be part of it somehow. And Thomas Barrow will probably take a back seat in the storyline to the Bates this time around, don't you think? This trailer ends with words on screen that read, the motion picture event returns, and the last slide, only in theaters this March. So since we started and stopped so much, here's an encore of the full trailer to enjoy. Years ago, before you were born, I met a man, and now I've come into the possession of a villa in the south of France. What? Three, two, one. They better be warned. The British are coming. And with that, I will say good night 
leave you to discuss my mysterious past. Speaking of encores, here's an encore of my first interview on Downton Blabby from season one. It is a chat to introduce myself and give you an idea of why I started Downton Blabby. This was recorded in summer of 2019 before the first Downton Abbey film. Stick around to the end of the episode to find out my plans for season two of Downton Blabby and details on how you can be part of the show. Hi, I am Mary Annis, and I'm here talking about Downton Abbey with my dear friend Sandy, who has had the brilliant idea to start a podcast about our shared passion. And I'm figuring if you're going to listen to the podcast, you might want to know a little bit more about her. So let's find out (laughs) about Downton Abbey. Can you tell us who your favorite character was or is? I can. And I'm going to tell you, I share it with some apprehension. Uh-oh. I got a rare manicure recently and found out that the manicurist is a big Downton Abbey fan. So we had this conversation. When I told her who my favorite character was, she kind of went, oh. I could tell it wasn't a, an answer that she liked, but I could defend it. Uh, my favorite character in Downton Abbey is Thomas. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Tell us why. Because he's the underdog. Uh, yes. I think you don't have to be gay in a time where being gay was illegal to understand what it's like to not belong. And almost all of his challenges at work, I guess I feel like I've had. I haven't hidden the dog to try to all of a sudden become the hero and ensure my job, but I understand why he's doing all those things because that's the only job he has. Yeah, and I think that even in his most, let's call it evil moments, (laughs) evil's probably a strong word, But you always felt like deep down underneath all of that, there was a good person in there. And they've shown that with his, how he felt about Sybil passing away, how he felt about George, uh, Lady Mary's son. So they've given him those moments. But I guess this last time where he's interviewing and all the other jobs that are even remotely options pay less and he has to do more, that is so relevant to today. And so many experiences that my friends are having. And I find him incredibly attractive. (laughs) Which never hurts. He's a very good looking man. (laughs) I really enjoy Thomas. Like there's no way I'd fast forward through that. Like if he's on screen, like I want to see what he's saying and what he's doing. And and part of the entertainment is that he's crafty and devious. I, I felt like I always understood why and could be empathetic to why he would do desperate and awful sandbagging things. I won't say you've 100% convinced me, but, but I can see it. But at least, yeah. Yeah, boy, that manicurist, boy, she was just like, oh. Because I'm pretty sure her favorite character was the Dowager Countess, so. Well, yeah. whose isn't, but aside from you. Aside but. from me, I know. <laughs> so then who is your most hated character? Oh, I would say... It's hard to hate on, right? No, it, I would it say Ms. Bunting, because she oh, really yeah. got on my nerves. Yeah, but I'll sure. tell you who really gets on my nerves is Denker. <gasps> oh. Yeah, I forgot about her. Yeah, yeah. She just wears on my last nerve, and it's also because I like Spratt so much. Spratt. Oh. So, yeah, but Denker was just, now, funny, I guess I could see why her behavior could sort of parallel Thomas's. Yeah. But, no, I just, man, she irritated me. Yeah, that whole, like, getting in debt with the card playing yeah. and all that, and the boob, no. No, don't like it. Yeah, and just would always try and blackmail Spratt. And yeah, I was not a fan of Denker. So then who is your most missed character? I do miss Carson's voice. He could read the dictionary. I I just enjoy so much about him. Yeah. Including that he used to be a charming Charlie. You know, there's just a lot to to like about Carson. But I'll enjoy seeing all of the characters again in the movie. But I guess that's one of those when you do rewatch the series. He's one of those comforting, reassuring, and and that's his role anyway, like kind of the traditional stalwart man who keeps the order together. So I guess as a, as a patriarchal figure, yeah, yeah, I miss, I miss Carson. What are you looking forward to out of the movie? I think it's going to be grand and just seeing all of this on the big screen and hearing the music. Yeah. Like, I think it's going to be 
<laughs> is anybody showing this on IMAX? You know, like, <laughs> right. I think it's going to win that idea. <laughs> it's like, it's going to, for as much as we've all enjoyed it on the small yeah. screen and felt this intimacy and these relationships with all these different characters, boy, I think to see it on the big screen and really be able to see some of that detail, you know, think about those scenes in the, in that library type room. Yeah. And now you'll really be able to see a lot of that detail and the costumes. And I, I'm looking forward to just experiencing yeah. This world, this fictitious yet historically accurate world on that level. And frankly, the theater is a communal vibe. I think it will be fun to watch this movie with other people who are interested in it and who may laugh at times or you might hear a sniffle over your shoulder when something like there is something about that communal experience. Yeah, I hadn't thought of the. I think you're right, though. I hadn't thought about it, but it's the kind of movie that's going to attract fans and so sitting there with other people that love this the way you do. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's what I'm looking forward to. On the other side, what are you worried about as far as the movie goes? I'm just going to say it. Say it's it. it's Julian Fellows. He's a master storyteller. We've had our ups and our downs in the series. Oh, I'm, will the Dowager Countess make it through this movie? This is a year and a half, supposedly, after the last episode. And if it started in 1912? That's, a, yeah, Titanic. Is that when the Titanic thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she was no spring chicken in 1912. Right. And I believe that was her quote was, I mean, what was she? She was like 110 by the time we finished. How How is there possibly any story left for her? Oh, well, there is, and that's good. But so that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about that I may have to say goodbye to Dowager Countess. Oh. How did you discover Downton Abbey? PBS. I lived in Chicago when it was first on. The episode that was the first for me was Lady Mary and Mr. Pamuk. Ah. That was my introduction to this. Because I started watching then, there were key things that I did not know, which were sort of interesting, Ah. that that turned into enjoyment for me. Now, my boyfriend lived in Milwaukee when I was in Chicago at this time. It wasn't every weekend that we would wind up meeting up, but let's say it was like the, the couple of weeks down the road, and it was a Sunday night, and we were together, and he said, oh, hey, um, I'm watching this show. And I'm like, oh, cool. What is it? So I'm like, I'm watching this show too. <laughs> so it was very cool to discover that he had discovered it on his own. Yeah. And so we started watching it early together. So it became kind of kind of like date night yeah. and yeah. something that we would watch together. And it was not bingy. It was weekly. Right, weekly. weekly. So you really had to make an appointment to watch it. So that was a fun way to enjoy that. But the funny thing is, if you started where I did, you didn't know that Thomas was gay, which is right. Which was interesting. Like right. I mean, I, I don't know how I kind of figured it out, but it, but my boyfriend knew he was. I was like, oh, why? Did, oh, surprise! Uh, you know, so that's I, news to me. Yeah, I'm like, how did you know? So you know, he couldn't articulate because in the first episode, whatever, I didn't know Thomas was gay until later. And then the running joke between me and my boyfriend is who between Lady Mary and Lady Edith is the bigger bitch. (laughs) Bitch is not a word I use very often. It has gravitas in my world, so I don't throw that word around lightly. So when, in the episode that Mike and I watched, like, immediately after the Pamuk episode, you got Edith writing a letter busting her sister. (laughs) Now that is a bitch move. Right. That is horrible. So I say to Mike, I'm like, yeah, and he says no, but... Mary's a bigger bitch. I'm like, no way. So we had a debate about that. So then every time Mary does something snotty, he'll just look at me and go, he'll just whisper it, bigger bitch. And I'm like, no, Edith is still a bigger bitch. So every now and then we just look at each other when one of those moments happens and just goes, bitch. Sybil was the glue that held that sisterhood together and... Yeah. And even when she died, it was like, can we get along better? Probably not. Like, wow, call it, call it out. Call it out. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to visit Highclere Castle, would you? Yes, I have been twice now. What? (laughs) The first time I went was in 2014. They give tours in the summertime, and you can walk all around the house. 
and be on the grounds and in the gardens. It's a beautiful space. Uh, High Clare Castle is just outside a town called Newberry. And to actually get out where sheep are grazing and it's wooded and mm. and it is that manor life, it, it really was a beautiful experience. And it was a gorgeous sunny day. Nice. And High Clare Castle itself... All those rooms are as vibrant and rich oh. as they look on camera. You can't take pictures on the tour, unfortunately. But my favorite part of that 2014 tour was you go up to the bedrooms and you walk down the stairs through the Great Hall to leave. Well, I'm walking down the stairs with the tour group, but I realize as I get to that landing, I'm like, oh my God, this is the staircase that Mary walked down when she was in her wedding gown. And, you know, you look down and there is your dad and Carson staring up at you like, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. We're so proud of you. I'm like, that was talking to my one of my favorite, favorite moments of the show. I'm like, yes. I'm going back up and I'm walking down this leisurely. <laughs> so I did. You. They didn't stop me. But, it, but you know, we're just kind of shuffling down yeah, the stairs. Right. I'm like, no, this is a grand wooden staircase with the red carpet. I want to touch the staircase. The yes. 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 So I basically did a second lap down Love the it. stairs before I left. Well, because I kind of got that last minute panic. It's like, once I walk out that door. I can't come back. Yeah. I was like, I'm not coming back in. Like, I need to savor this moment. So it is very cool. You know, if you think of that moment when Mary and Matthew are dancing together in front of yes, the Christmas yes, tree. Yes. And Lavinia Swire oh, catches. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not sad she was gone either. Oh, I liked Lavinia. I felt bad for Lavinia. You look down into that beautiful, beautiful room. And it, yeah. it really does hit you. It's just a wonderful historic space. Yeah. So High Clark Castle, definitely recommend it. And on that trip, downstairs is an Egyptology exhibit. What? Because Lord Carnarvon... Yes, I actually know why. <laughs> but that's so cool. Yeah. It was one of the first explorers, exactly, mm-hmm. to excavate King Tut's tomb with another man named... I think his first name was John, but last name was Carpenter. Yeah. Lord Carnarvon passed away while this dig was going on, and it was... The lady, Carnarvon, at the time, who said, finish the job, Mr. Carpenter. Now, I think that was pretty huge because that was obviously very expensive. But what's sad is I just, I always specifically make sure I remember Carpenter's name because he is the one who did this to his death and he pretty much died like no no one one noticed. Yeah. 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 I was just at High Clare Castle a second time because I got very excited. It was announced that there would be a summer concert called Downton Abbey Live, and it was a concert performed by the London Chamber Orchestra of the music of Downton Abbey, narrated by Jim Carter. Yes! As Carson. I budgeted my nickels and pennies so well that I bought a VIP experience ticket. Yes. So I was in the fifth row for all the music, and John Lund, the music composer, played piano and was part of this performance as well. That's amazing. Yeah, it was very magical. And uh, the VIP experience allowed you to meet Jim Carter and John Lund before the show. Have a little chat, have a little photo. So I got to hear Jim that Carter voice. exactly <laughs> in person. Say your name even. Yeah. <laughs> and while I was in line to meet Jim and John, I'm just like I'm on first name basis with them. They're not on speed dial or anything. I wish they were. Um, Are you sure? I work to get them on the podcast. I'll see what I can do. Ooh, I like that. Uh, but while I was waiting in line, Lord and Lady Carnarvon were there chatting with some people. So I got to meet Lady Carnarvon and Lord Carnarvon and <gasps> get a photo with them. So yeah, so it was a very, very good visit. That's it was fantastic. a very good visit. And it was a beautiful summer night. Oh. It was a perfect summer night. So I don't know if they'll make that an annual experience or not. That's fantastic. Yeah, so definitely recommend a High Clare visit. Cool. I'm putting it on the bucket list right now. Maybe maybe we should go back together. I love that idea. I need to get Lady Carnarvon on speed dial. Yes. <laughs> Mary and I attended Marquette University together and have been friends ever since. So that's a bit about me. I'm a TV, radio, and event host and podcast host based in Milwaukee. Looking forward to connecting with you. In future Downton Blabby episodes, expect more discussion and speculation, maybe even some skepticism from guests about the new film, plus lively conversations about all kinds of aspects of Downton Abbey. This is a podcast for Downton Abbey fans by a Downton Abbey fan, and your opinions and questions are welcome. Email me, comment on social media, send me a video or a voice note. You can leave a podcast rating or podcast review. You can respond through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Sign up for my email list at sandymax.com. All of my contact info is on the Sandy Max website, spelled S-A-N-D-Y-M-A-X-X 
dot com. Yeah, two X's. Also on social media at Sandy Max on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Downton Blabby social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm available. Tell your favorite Downton Abbey fan about this podcast so we can all share in the fun as the movie release approaches. Your rating and your review of Downton Blabby will help me know what you like about the podcast and what you want to hear on this show. Apple and Google make it pretty easy to leave five stars in a sentence. And it's fun to look at the statistics so far. The top three United States listening are California, Illinois, and Massachusetts. Thank you. The top three countries are the U.S., the U.K., and tied in third, the Netherlands and India, showing what a great reach Downton Abbey has had around the world. So please spread the word. And when you share the podcast with a Facebook post or tweet, if you use hashtag Downton Blabby, uh, I can find you and reshare that. Spread the good word of Downton Blabby in your own way. I encourage you to listen to past episodes in season one for a fun look back at the expectations we had for the first film and discussions about characters from a variety of perspectives of fans of the show. Thank you to everyone who's been a part in getting Downton Blabby started and encouraged me to relaunch for a second season. You know who you are, and I'm glad I can call myself an active podcaster again. A very special thank you to tall Paul Russell, who is the wonderful voice you hear at the beginning of this episode. I'm Sandy Max. Thank you for listening. Thank you for interacting on social media. I look forward to meeting you back here on Downton Blabby. Scarf Hole.